I'm Tyler, and this is the Antisocial Network. Don't look away. Let the fear wash over you. Hey, T-Dog. What is up in this his house? Welcome to your number one source of internet oddity. My life is a living hell. There's just so much beauty in the world, you know? Here we host conversations with interesting people across the internet. The God you believe in is not only not good, that God made a world filled with liberals. Here's of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You haven't heard of them, but I have. Perhaps I am cringe, but that makes me free. Join us every Friday for discussions on culture, entertainment, politics, religion, and whatever happens to catch our fancy that week. Hell is actually real, and Christianity was right all along. Sorry. Oh. The cities are decaying, destroyed by decades of leftist policies, returned to monkeys. You're probably thinking this is some pretty deep stuff, and you're right. This episode of the Antisocial Network is brought to you by North Arrow Coffee Company, a veteran-owned company that donates 15% of its proceeds to pro-life groups like Soundview Pregnancy Services and Compass Care Crisis Pregnancy Center in Buffalo, New York. Support the Antisocial Network and use code ANTISOCIAL10 at checkout to receive 10% off your next purchase of coffee and other coffee-related products. Thank you very much. This week we are joined by Reformed Zoomer. He is a online redeemed, redeemed, redeemed Zoomer. Zoomer. I oh, I, <laughs> pray, uh, Presbyterian uh, Freudian slip there, but uh, Redeemed Zoomer. He is a Presbyter- member of the Presbyterian Church uh, of America and is a, a nope. very PCUSA. PCUSA. PCA. Is it, P- oh, is it yeah, okay? I thought you were PCA for a while. No, PC, I've never been PCA. I've always been PCUSA. I am slandering you horribly this morning. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay. But yeah, uh, you're also, I believe, either the founder or one of the founders of Operation Reconquista, and uh, he's joined today to talk about that. So how, good, to, good to have you on and meet you. So Yeah, first of all, don't feel bad about calling me Reform Zoomer. It's the Mandela effect. Everyone thinks that's my name. I have no idea why, <laughs> but that's just how it is. It's so, your vibe. It's uh, the... <laughs> you're, in, you're, you're, you're in very good company. And yes, yeah, so I am the member, a member of the Presbyterian Church USA, um, which is kind of what Reconquista is all about. Presbyterian Church USA is what's called a mainline Protestant denomination. It's one of the uh, denominations with the historical continuity in terms of institutions and stuff, but it's also been hijacked by a lot of false teaching and theological liberalism. So Operation Reconquista is about getting these mainline Protestant churches on the right track. And for every major Protestant tradition, there is a mainline denomination. There's a mainline denomination, and there's like evangelical offshoots. So for Anglicanism, the mainline Anglican denomination is, of course, the Episcopal Church, or in Great Britain, it's the Church of England. And for my tradition, the Reformed tradition, the mainline church is the Presbyterian Church USA, and things like the PCA or the OPC or the EPC, all these little smaller things, are evangelical offshoots. So, in terms of what I believe theologically, I'd probably be a lot closer to the average person in one of these offshoots, but Recon- the Reconquista philosophy is to try and reverse the practice of, of splitting off, to recognize the good things that these offshoots have to offer, but to push for a reunification, so we can sort of have the theology of those in, in these offshoots within the institutions of the mainline church. I was going to say, I was talking to one of my colleagues a few weeks ago about these offshoot denominations because in, in a sense they're mainline in that they have a name above their title which i which, which to me that's more what at least the you know mainline protestantism means to me is just that we we have a sense of do, of a denominational integrity and creedal responsibility and doctrine and stuff like that that we all ad, ad, adhere to as opposed to the kind of the the morass of non-denominationalism but I think I I appreciate that that distinction because and although I don't know if I necessarily like the ACNA being called evangelical but I guess that's <laughs> I guess that's a an accurate term of sorts so Yeah, it makes sense. Um it it's it's weird when you get to these high church offshoots cuz it's like I don't know, is the LCMS mainline or evangelical? It has the historical continuity to be considered mainline except it's not liberal. So uh, it's the, the, it's weird the, the way the media categorizes mainline and evangelical. Um, but generally the idea is main, the mainline churches are the ones with the institutional roots and the ones that are more liberal. 
And I think one of the premises of Reconquista ideology is that in the past hundred years, the left has been massively successful in conquering whatever is most culturally important. So the media, the institutions, the universities, and the most established churches. So part of the Reconquista ideology, like the red pill underlying Reconquista, is seeing that generally the more conservative an institution is, the less well-established it is. And the reason for that is just how successful the left has been in their long march through the institutions, which was the plan all of the left all along with like the Frankfurt School and everything. I mean, that goes back to like conquest law that uh, any not non-explicitly conservative group will eventually become progressive in some sense. And that that's definitely happened to the mainline Protestant denominations to a absolutely depressing degree. And I mean, I, I see yeah. it out here in the middle of uh, Boonies, Tennessee, where you have these... You have these small towns that have their their four mainline churches, and somehow in these towns where the the politics is ninety percent Republican, the, the the first Presbyterian church is doing homilies every Sunday about why uh, why female priests are an important part of the uh, part of the, of the body politic of the church, and you just wonder is like well how did how does that even happen? But it is it the 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 ideological overtaking has been intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what conservatives see all these things, they see the liberalism in our churches and in our universities and in our cities. And for the past hundred years, the strategy of conservative Christians has been retreatism. And I'm not saying everyone who's in an offshoot denomination is guilty of retreatism. It's just the general ethos, the general ethos of especially American conservatism. It, it goes back to the fundamentalist movement in the early 20th century, which basically it assumes a sort of pessimism that leftism is basically stronger than we are. And no matter what we do, the leftists will always conquer the institutions. So it basically says um, the best thing for us to do is just to retreat and to distance ourselves as much as possible from from the institutions because the institutions are getting hijacked by, by liberalism. So retreatism means you have to be skeptical of mainstream science. You have to uh, shelter all your kids and move to a farm in the middle of nowhere, retreat from the cities, uh, don't go to university. Uh, and if you have a church, make sure the church has absolutely zero trace of any liberalism. And if it, if it does go liberal, you have to split off and form a new church. So it's just this general retreatist philosophy that I think a lot of people have. And um, I'm, I, again, a lot of times when I say, talk about retreatist philosophy, people think I'm like insulting everyone who's part of a, an offshoot. It's like, no, there's great things that come out of these offshoots, but it would be a lot better if the churches were unified like they used to be. Yeah, I've, I've seen that a lot firsthand recently. I mean, I was just talking to a couple uh, that just showed up to my ACNA church this past weekend. And I asked them, well, where are you from? And they said, oh, I'm from a, an Episcopal church down the road and they've just gone crazy. And then I looked up that Episcopal church and it was on the list of Episcopal churches in Operation Reconquista. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't think it's that. It's probably not even that the church is liberal. It's just that there's maybe like one or two elements bleeding in that they just kind of felt like, oh, now the church is done. We're done. We're moving out. I'm just, I I don't imagine. I haven't been to that church, but I don't imagine it's that excessively bad if it's if it's on your list. So. Mm-hmm. And they they tend to think that it's like. If there's any liberalism at all, then it's it's completely fallen to liberalism. So maybe if they have, I don't know, one elder who's very woke or posts woke things on Facebook, uh, it, it's basically as if um, a lot of conservatives act like the French in World War II. It's like once the invasion starts, you have to surrender right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I guess just to kind of jump right into the meat of this, I mean, you're you're obviously deeply ingratiated on ingratiated on the uh, this hive of scum and villainy that is theology Twitter, and you yes. see firsthand the uh, the uh, the tendency for our our lovely Catholic friends to say that this that this retreat and this slow motion death that the mainline churches are experiencing is a sign of our of the the failures of Protestantism overall and our inability to hold any sort of authority. So. I guess just to put it plainly, can can you do you think the mainline churches can be saved? Well, if Catholics are saying that mainline decline is the fruit of Protestantism, like bro, there were centuries upon centuries where it was normal for priests to have prostitutes. Okay, let's let's put things in perspective over here. That the Catholic Church was called the pornocracy in oh the my. Middle Ages. <laughs> oh, I think that's a bit worse. I think uh, priests having prostitutes is a little bit worse than Pastor Emily. Okay, but. 
Um, it, it's a good question. Can can the mainline churches be saved? Uh, yes, God always preserves a remnant because no matter what has happened in these mainline churches, there is always a remnant of faithful pastors that has continued, and people just don't know about this. Um, liberalism is definitely very bad in all the mainline denominations, but it's also overrepresented. They're always ten times louder than their conservative counterparts. Um, at, at general assemblies, for example, in the PCUSA, um, they always vote for liberal things, but I recently learned from some higher-ups in the denomination that the general assembly is gerrymandered, that the like the liberals are definitely in the higher-ups in the leadership, and they pick who gets to vote at general assembly. So it creates this illusion that liberals, that the denomination is more liberal than it is, and that causes psychological warfare against the conservatives. It scares them into leaving, and that becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy, and the denomination ends up actually becoming liberal. And, and a good example of this is, I'm not sure if you heard of the Sparkle Creed, or there's a piece of <laughs> Yes, I have. Well, the thing is, I made, a, I made a video saying, stop talking about that. So the Sparkle Creed was written by a single crazy lady, a pastor in the ELCA, right? One person. You could have examples of individuals doing all sorts of crazy things. There's also I can give you examples of individual mainline pastors, individual Episcopal priests doing uh, Trump Bible studies, um, talking about how how Trump is going to save the world. So you can find yeah, individual examples bad. of anything, but so it, on the left and the right. But the thing is, she was doing that for attention because as soon as she did that, both the secular media and the Christian media said. This creed is now the new creed of these churches. It's like, no, it's not. But once people started talking about that, once people started granting her wish by giving her the intention she wanted, it caused people to say, well, I guess this is, I guess they've won. I guess we have to leave the churches now. It's a vicious cycle. So the more, um, the more we, people uh, react to sort to this sort of stuff, the more people talk about how liberal the mainline churches are, uh, the more liberal they actually become. It's sort of like they, they speak their own liberalism into existence. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. And, and the, the cost is that it's just going to be a massive – it's going to create a massive hole in the center of American Christianity because as, as much as people don't – as much as a lot of people on all sides of this debate tend not to like it, like historic mainline Protestantism is a lot of the reason why America used to function as a country the way it did. I mean the old Methodists and the old Presbyterians and the old Episcopalians, like – they were kind of the heart of American intellectualism and moralism for 150 years up until just very recently. And the fact that so mm -hmm. many people have moved to the evangelical churches or just jumped off and became and either became Orthodox or Catholic or joined one of these, uh, you know, lifeboat traditions, I guess, like the ACNA or the PCA, like it, it, it doesn't it, it really speaks to this kind of loss at the center of American culture and why Christianity is on the on, kind of on the back foot, like. And the, the cost of it's going to be that, like, I, I even just on a cultural level, is going to be a massive amount of cultural die-off in the next 20 years, especially as the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church just have the, have all the boomers, uh, you know, die off. And that's going to dr drastically reduce their numbers, basically down to nothing. All these historic church buildings are going to get turned into, are, are going to be converted, torn down or converted into civil engineering projects. I mean, I've already seen a hundred churches turn into bars. It like, it, it's going to be yeah. a massive, like it's, it, it's both going to have the effect of culture, decline, cultural decline, and just a massive historical loss as all this history is just systematically destroyed by, by the lack of the, uh, the, the, the lack of that core. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that, even even those who are not in the main line need to recognize how culturally important the mainline churches are because every society is founded on a certain religious institution and with without which it cannot be revived so like england was founded on the church of england and uh for italy it's it's the roman catholic church and for america it's the mainline protestant churches as as good as the cultural influence of some catholics are america is not a catholic nation america is fundamentally a protestant nation as as jordan cooper told me uh, so if we're to revive American culture, we need to revive the Protestant churches that it was built upon. The issue is that right now, the Protestant churches America was founded upon are, for the most part, in these in these mainline denominations. That's why they're called mainline, because they have that sort of continuity. 
And I think in a, a problem with Americans is they have too much of an individualistic mindset. They think the church is simply individuals plus ideas. They don't think the, of the church in institutional terms. So they often think it's like, okay, why can't we just all become non-denominational? And as long as we individually have good biblical teachings, that that's all that matters, right? Well, no, because... As the church has become less institutionalized, more decentralized, more non-denominational, as that has happened, Christianity and religion overall has been on a steady decline in America that really has not shown any signs of reversing since the 1950s. And it's like people see this trend and they just keep promoting the same strategy, the strategy of we just need to keep splitting off, keep running away, keep forming new things until something works. Um, I think it was Einstein who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I, I don't think we can solve the problem of endlessly rising atheism without reviving institutional Christianity. And now there, are, there might be different ways to do that. I know that there's some in the ACNA who really want to turn the ACNA in. their own, I think they can definitely contribute to doing that if there could eventually be a reunion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't foresee the possibility of an ACNA TEC reunion unless the TEC just completely dwindles down its population down to, you know, five digit membership or something crazy like that. And who knows what the church looks like at that point. But what do you, what do you think in terms of bringing back people who've made the jump from evangelicalism to to the mainline, because I, I think for a lot of them, it's not necessarily an ideological decision so much as it is just a, a reactionary desire to be away from the libs. Do you think that, it, it, assuming your Operation Reconquista goes forward, it would be, it, we, there's a case we made that a lot of them would be willing to come back? Uh, maybe, especially because a lot of people leave the mainline not because their individual church is bad, but just because they hear these things about the mainline in the news and they think, I don't want to be associated with it. What I want people to understand is how does you leaving a space where there's liberalism, how is that fighting liberalism in any way? Um, people f almost have this idea that if they storm out, the liberals are going to feel bad and, and reconsider their ways and be like, oh, man, this conservative left. I feel so bad. No, they're just going to be like, oh, thanks for leaving. Now we have even more power. So if you want to personally distance yourself from liberalism or from anything that's even associated with liberalism, you could do that. But that's an individualistic way of thinking. If you want to combat liberalism, the worst thing you can do is remove yourself from it. It's just simple battle tactics. You don't win a single. It's impossible to win a battle by by retreating. And if you do retreat, it should only ever be to regroup and then advance once again. So looking at Operation Reconquista itself, how long has this been? Well, how, where did it come from and how long has this been a, a, an idea that's been being floated around by you and your friends? Right. So Operation Reconquista is less than a year old. Um, it started in 2023. It started with uh, people with zero credentials, me and some other friends on Instagram, uh, quickly moved to other platforms. But in this past year, what we've done is... We've gotten a lot of pastors and elders and people that actually do have credentials and positions of authority in the church uh, on board with our movement. The Episcopals even got a couple bishops on board with their version of the Reconquista. And the Reconquista is is decentralized. It's like I am not the, the CEO of the Reconquista or anything. Um, the Recon Reconquista is a philosophy. It's an ideology. And we do have a Discord server where we coordinate some things. Like on Reformation Day, all the Reconquista movements collaborated to post 95 theses to each respective denomination on the doors of as many churches as possible. Um, but overall, Reconquista is it's a movement that has sprung up only in 2023 so far. And uh, there's pastors from each of the seven mainline denominations uh, that, have, that have begun to participate in it. Well, let's hone in on the, the Reformation Day event. How did that, how many, do you know how many churches uh, had the, 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 the theses posted on their doors? Uh, in terms of physically on their doors, uh, the number's over a thousand. We don't know exactly how many. We know it's over a thousand. Wow. Uh, in terms of churches that were emailed, uh, tens of thousands. We try to email every church in every mainline denomination. 
that wasn't exactly possible because some of these churches are very old and do not have emails. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of those churches might not even know that emails exist. Um, uh, some of these, uh, some of these churches like don't have anyone like under the age of 80. <laughs> so like that, that's the thing. That's the thing with mainline churches. Uh, but we, we contacted every mainline church we possibly could. Sometimes it was even by actually using the mail. Yeah, that still exists, by the <laughs> way, for those of you who are aware. That's amazing. I mean, I... And I there was, yeah, go on, go on. I, 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 I'm just going to say I've seen a lot of those churches. There's a there's a little Episcopal parish I like to commune at in, uh, in South Wisconsin that's literally just 11 people, and they don't even have a a rector on staff because they don't have because they're they're so small that a lot of a lot of times they either have the the the, the episcopal bishop of milwaukee will come out and do their mass or they'll just do it an office uh because they can't don't have anyone that can actually do it they're so small and i mm-hmm. i only found them because the episcopal church lists them on their website they have no online presence other than that but i know I- exactly there was this one guy in like rural Florida who was distributing the theses, and he said every mainline church he went to loved the theses because it's it's rural Florida. But <laughs> ideally, we will have conservatism not just be relegated to swamps full of alligators and actually be part of the part of the cities once again. And I don't even like the word conservative much, even though you know what I'm talking about, because yeah, it yeah. implies go- implies going back. To the past, which is not possible. We need to go forward into the kingdom of God, not past into some um, golden age. Uh, well, let, but, let's, let's delve into the thesis. Yeah. I mean, I, we don't have to go through all seven of them, but what is – when you say – it's obviously these are 95 different points for all seven of these churches. What is it asking mm-hmm. for in the in the, in the the grand scheme of things? Is, is it's, it's, I doubt it's explicit uh, – what, 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 what little I read, it didn't seem – explicitly partisan or anything like that it was very you know basic like you know this is the bare minimum standard of what you need to do to be considered a church yeah it advocates basic orthodoxy now i can't speak for every denomination there's a different version for each denomination and like i said i am was not the authority over over doing this i authored the 95 theses to the pcusa it says nothing about female pastors. It doesn't explicitly mention homosexuality. It implicitly does. Because I said scripture and natural law need to be the basis for the church's teaching on sexuality. But what it really says, it gets to the root of the issue. I see the whole female pastor and sexuality things. Those are the symptoms of liberalism, not the cause. A lot of people um, a lot of people think oh, once a church has a female pastor, that's when they have to leave, even though Theological liberalism has been around for over 100 years in the church. Liberalism such as denying the divinity of Christ, which is a lot worse than Pastor Susan being a pastor. So the first thesis in, to the PCUSA, I think it's the same for most of them, is Christian ministers must not be permitted to deny that Jesus is truly God. That's the first thing. The second thesis is they must not be permitted to deny that he physically rose from the dead. You know, St. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So when it comes to the essentials of our faith, everything is either an extension of Jesus as God or an extension of the resurrection. So then I sort of go, I say they have to basically affirm everything else in the creed as well. They need to affirm he died for our sins. I say certain ways of perceiving God, like process theology or pantheism, that's heretical. Because um, in like uh, the, the UCC, for example, you'll find a lot of pastors who's like, God is the, the change that exists in all of us to make a better society. So they'll say we believe in God, um, but God is – it's it's less about believing in a being that actually exists and more about how can the idea of God transform our hearts to make a loving community of togetherness. Um, that, that's sort of what it's like in, for a lot of these pastors. And remember, these pastors that are heretics, they're not as large as um, we're made to think, but they are the loudest by, by far. And of course, it, it should be zero. There should be zero pastors denying Jesus is God. That's even atheists um, often agree with that. Um, there should, I, I, one of the theses said pastors whose theology is essentially Unitarian Universalist should recuse themselves from jobs at a Presbyterian church and just join the Unitarian Universalist church. Because at least the Unitarians are honest, and that's what I like a bit better about them. 
Yeah, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's probably easier to get the church to, uh, you know, to, to admit, admit these basic doctrines and just kind of ring, uh, ring out the John Spong level of uh, basic heresy than it is to just get, convince everyone at once to, to to drum out female pastors and priests. But, I, I mean, that's, that's the, the important, you know, the first step that's necessary in all of this. Has there been mm -hmm. any level of backlash or negative reception to the theses? For the, from the people who've put them up? Well, from the higher-ups in the denomination, yeah. So I apparently every single ELCA bishop sent out an email warning about the, the Lutheran Reconquista group. Um, to be fair, the, the Lutheran Reconquista is a bit less professional than some of the other groups. It's, it's like mostly um, very, very y young people writing these theses. Um, so they, they were less careful than I was, less careful than the Episcopalians were. What, 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 um, what did you but, do, hire Corey Mahler? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, for the Lutheran Reconquista, because like I said, it's a decentralized movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. Could, you could tell it was, you know, teenage teenagers complaining about liberalism a bit more than like a, a thoughtful theologian. But given how corrupt the ELCA pattern the ELCA uh, patterns of authority are uh, guerrilla warfare might be necessary, so that might be providence. Um, but even even with the PCUSA, even given I was extremely careful in how I worded the theses, you know how the left works. Anything short of full affirmation is is anathema. Leftism is a religion, and anything short of perfection is heresy. Uh, so apparently, my girlfriend's presbytery they all sent out uh, an email warning about the Reconquista, and. Um, she was actually interrogated at her church, and the pastor asked her if she was part of the Reconquista. <laughs> does, um, does he know that you're that she's dating you, or is it just did they just like smell it on her and just like there's a dissident in our ranks? Uh, I'm not. I, I don't know how they came to suspect her, um, but she was able to convince the pastor that Reconquista is um, not about attacking the church, but about reviving the church. Um, I'm not sure if they originally knew she was dating me, but, uh, uh she, she, she's very, she's very smart. She, even though her pastor is kind of liberal, I mean, this isn't her main church. She, she's part of a PCA church, but she's been involved in this other PCUSA church in addition to help Reconquista, Reconquista it. Cause we, we do say that no matter what, you need to be part of an Orthodox church, uh, whether it's mainline or not. If you have a solid Orthodox mainline church near you, great, but do not attend a liberal mainline church for the sake of converting it. You could be involved in a liberal church for the sake of evangelizing to it if you're strong in your faith and if you are part of a, uh, a confessional church in addition. We're very strict about that. We are not sending people into liberal churches. In fact, we need liberal churches to die. Well, yeah, I mean, a big part of the website is the the online, uh, I guess, database of, like, churches that are willing to be a part of this entire project. was the, When do you, that, the, the data, the spreadsheet you put out, is that churches that have responded positively to the list, or just churches that have put out statements of faith that are aligned with yours? So are you talking about our Google Maps? Yeah, the Google Map, yeah. Yeah, uh, so these are basically any mainline church we think is not liberal. And sometimes we're a bit mistaken. Sometimes the website will say something good, but then someone from that church will say, actually, uh, that website's 15 years old. And since then we've gotten more liberal. So the map isn't perfect, but the map is our best effort to plot out based on the connections we have and the information we have to plot out which mainline churches are not liberal. And we can confidently say that um, at least 10% of every mainline denomination is solidly confessional. Now, 10% may not seem like a lot, but remember how big these denominations are. So, for example, um, in the PCUSA, uh, I, I've, a statistic is that like only only 30% uh, of the pastors in the PCUSA voted against gay marriage. 30% of 8,000 denominations, that's 3,700 churches. Um, that means at least in 2012, this might have changed since then, um, that means at that time there were at least 3,700 conservative PCUSA churches, which sounds unfathomable. People are surprised when I tell them there's even one or two conservative PCUSA churches. Um, even in the, the UCC, which is the most liberal out of all of them, there is a network of conservative churches within that as well. 
So all these denominations are dominated by liberals who are overrepresented in the hierarchies of those churches, but they all also have a conservative resistance movement. So I did not start this conservative resistance. I'm just the megaphone for pastors who have already been in this fight for, for many, many years. When I was looking over the Google Docs or the Google Maps, I was surprised by just how, like, just what I was seeing in terms of, like, the details. I mean, in just in central Tennessee alone, there are 16 Episcopal churches that would apply, that would fit under that, under the, under your guidelines. And it's, it's fascinating to see, to, to see those, like, patches of just denominations you think are lost that are just, that, that does seem like, that, that do seem like they have these massive holdouts. Mm -hmm. Well, remember in the Episcopal Church, uh, some of the bishops there uh, have actually um, are actually supporting us. Um, so there's really four conservative bishops, four like hardline conservative bishops in the Episcopal Church. One of them is in Tennessee, and that's why there's like a, a patch of solid conservative Episcopal churches in Tennessee. Um, so in in the Episcopal Church. Even though the hierarchy, there's a lot of very corrupt bishops, there are also a lot of really solid bishops, like George Sumner of Dallas, for example. He's an amazing, not an, only an amazing bishop, but also an amazing theologian as well. Indeed, and there's a couple. And I, there was there, there, I, I was disappointed that there that it that it, what that it did seem a little bit patchy. Like for whatever reason, there's no ELCA churches in Middle Tennessee that fit the criterion, and, and there's no like it, it's just, it's mostly just the Episcopal ones. So I guess it's it's highly selective about who's you know, like you said, who the bishops are, who the people that are hiring them are, who's being sent out to these churches. I mean, but it, it, yeah, it, it, it's fascinating to look at. And it does seem like a couple of the, yeah. And it seems like a couple of the ones on the list have explicitly endorsed Operation Reconquista too. Yeah, it's definitely patchy. Like, and some would surprise you. For some reason, uh, the most conservative PCUSA churches are largely in California. The San Diego Presbytery uh, condemned the whole gay marriage decision. I talked to the pastor of First Pres San Diego, a huge, very influential church. He's totally on board with all this. Uh, First Presbyterian Church Hollywood, that's right, the Hollywood in California, where all the, you know, um, uh, drag queen factories are. First Presbyterian Church Hollywood is very solidly evangelical and actually makes a lot of the evangelical Sunday school curriculum for, for tons of other churches. So there are these hidden gems in the main line. We didn't make the gems. We just dug them up. Reconquista is less about um, creating things out of thin air. It's mostly, you know, young social media people like me trying to raise awareness about these strongholds that already exist and have existed for a long time. And the goal, I, from what I understand from the website, is just to put as many people as possible in these churches and essentially to upend them from a, you know, put them in church government and just kind of slowly start repairing the damage over the long term more so than it is necessarily like short term goals. Yeah, short term, what we want to do is we want to just revive these churches, breathe new life into them. Um, and... If we do that, all we have to do is just sit on our butts and wait a generation for the rest of the churches to die out because they will. And then th we're going to win the battle basically just by walking over dead bodies. It's just going to be um, – it's it's kind of the, the warfare where you just wait out your enemy. And because these liberal churches, they are desperate for leadership. Even in a lot of moderate churches, they hand out leadership positions like free candy. It took my dad two years to become an elder at our PCUSA church because they're just so desperate for leadership. I've had people saying that they attended a church once, a mainline church once, and they were immediately offered a, a, a position teaching Sunday school or something. So it's like, especially if you have a missionary mindset, there is not a single place that is easier for you to have a missionary impact than these mainline churches where they are so desperate for people to fill the ranks of leadership. I walked into an ACNA church and within six months to a year they were already offering to nominate me for their vestry so that i can i can definitely speak through firsthand experience that there's a especially in a lot of these churches where the 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 average age is geriatric there is a desire to put a young person in charge and you know have them answer all the questions of how do we get all the young people in how do we get all these people in and that's certainly an advantage for the mainline because the mainline has a lot of these great aspects of tradition that so many people that are our are, are age who are joining the church aren't finding evangelicalism and are generally jumping ship to uh, orthodoxy or Catholicism for. Mm -hmm. I think that would make a big yeah, difference definitely. for us. 
Definitely. And um, part of Reconquista, I know that this is what we get clowned for, is the appeal to tradition. Um, the critics of Reconquista often say, oh, you're sending people into apostate churches just because there's pretty buildings. Right. Um, if all we care, if we all, if all we cared about was pretty buildings, we wouldn't be doing a reconquista. We would just be content in our apostate pretty churches. No. Um, however, it is true that tradition matters, and people long for something that's traditionally rooted. It's like you. I'm sure you've seen waves and waves of young people converting to Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Yeah. Why is that happening? Uh, they would say, "Oh, it's just because we're right." Okay, well, if you if you're right now, then you've always been right. Why are people just realizing that now? It's clearly not that modern people are the wisest people in history, uh, unless you're trying to unless you are trying to claim that. Uh, the reason we are seeing waves of converts to Catholicity now is because for the first time in history, Protestantism is alienated from its own traditional institutions and. People need tradition. Non-denominational was non-denominationalism was an experiment, but it's it's largely failed. And people need to be rooted in something traditional. And when Protestantism is in exile, like it is, there's this illusion that Protestantism doesn't have tradition. I'm, I'm sure you've seen countless Catholic and Orthodox memes saying like, "Here's a beautiful Catholic church. Here's a beautiful Orthodox church. These Protestants are meeting in a strip mall pizza hut next to next to Applebee's um, and a strip club." Right. It's like if you actually know any Protestant history, that's ridiculous. Protestantism has just as many beautiful churches as Catholicism and Orthodoxy, just as much beautiful hymnody and psalmody. Uh, but if, if they're alienated from their own institutions, it will create this illusion. It's not as though buildings are the, the, the core of our faith or anything, but it's it's a fruit of being rooted in tradition, which is something that intuitively people people know the church needs to be. We're just about out of time. Uh, can be, where can people find you and find out more about Operation Reconquista? Yeah, just go to, um, if you want to find out about me, you could go to just look up Redeem Zoomer on Instagram, YouTube. But Operation Reconquista is the more important thing. Just go to OperationReconquista.com. All right, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, getting to uh, dig into this a little bit, and I really hope that this does take off and make a difference. Yeah, thank you. God bless. You too. The Antisocial Network is a Groupthink Productions and Cultural Review podcast. Editing, hosting, and producing are by Tyler Hummel, art by Crystal Cowley, and original music is composed by Guap Squad Gang and Melissa Lafira. Like, subscribe, and leave a comment below and tell us anyone you think would be a good guest for the show. Thank you for listening.